single, you got to pick one, single most indispensable tool that you own. The one that you would never, ever be without. One. Cutting torch. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, gang, how we doing? Here we go. We're going to get started. Okay, so we're, this, is, this is a brand new thing for us. We're going to try starting things out with a little bit of a demonstration. Uh, as I was just saying before, this is Jeff Del Papa, the founder of the Nerds, ladies and gentlemen. Let's hear it for him. Combing the scrap heaps of New England to make things. <laughs> that it do. Anyway... Um, this is Decisions, Decisions. It was built to, um, uh, at the request of a TV company, and they wanted a bit of spectacle for an otherwise bland show on probability and chance. Hmm. So why don't you do the honors? See that? So, uh, so oh, yeah, it's sure. It's loaded. So, so, so explain exactly what it is that we're looking at and, and, and what's been built here. Well, um, this is a scale model of my thumb. <laughs> I get and it. And that is a stand-in for a manhole cover. <laughs> so this is instead of we could learn about probability by flipping, by coin. flipping coins. And this you've is built just a, thing a large coin. <laughs> that would flip manhole covers. Yes. <laughs> All right. So who thinks it's going to land tails? By round of applause, who thinks it's going to land tails? Who thinks it's going to land heads? <laughs> All right, heads is the winner. So I just pull this string? Yeah, one good like sharp toward tuck. me? Yeah, stand a little bit more to the <laughs> side. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Tails. Tails. <laughs> you guys want to do it one more time? Yeah. Can we do it one more time? All right. It oh. actually flips fair. We've tried it over 500 times. So he was just saying, I don't know if you guys caught that, he said it flips fair. They've tried it 500 times to make sure that it is statistically fair. <laughs> <laughs> that was the other one they had me build. <laughs> I, right. I, the... the there's the heads. Everybody see the heads? Designed the head, by eight-year-olds. Uh, 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 the head of a clown, bright purple hair. Clowns are in the news these days, too. Yeah. Yes. The, the, other, the other one they had me make for the same show, uh, we called a sure bet. And it was uh, better than 90% reliable at flipping the way you wanted. So what's the, how, do you, how do you make it differently that it, it flips that way? You are, you are very careful about how much energy you put into the coin. Wow. And so it was just done with the falling weight. What, what's happening now? Well... You're just this, you're pumping it up. Yes. This so where does this go? Just goes right on top. Right on top. That's my, that's my finger curled around, and this is my thumb. There it is. All right, so who's Here voting this time? Who says it's heads? Who says it's going to be tails? Firing. It's heads. heads. I think anyway, that, thanks for the uh, introduction, Ed. That um, it's always fun to do this with the crowd. <laughs> anyway, as you know, my name's Jeff. I do many things, but. Um, the one that got me here is building strange machines. Um, again, this is Decisions, Decisions. Uh, it was built for a TV show, and um, it actually worked. Um, now, tonight I'm going to talk about sort of what I build and just a little bit about how I build it. But I'm going to start out with talking about why I do it. Um, I've heard a lot of artists getting interviewed, and one of the things that they always talk about is how they, they can't not paint or sculpt or whatever. 
and it's a compulsion, and to be honest, I'm the same way. But in my case, it has to be build or fix things. In some ways, this is an advantage because, as, as you might tell, I don't necessarily care how pretty they look. Uh, I, most of the stuff I build would fit just fine on a Mad Max set. But um, they do have to work. And you know, this is a compulsion. Um, I freely admit it. I lose sleep at night trying to figure out how to solve particular problems, et cetera. Um, this all grew up out of being really curious as a kid as to how things worked and t taking a somewhat direct approach to f figuring it out, which is find something, wonder, take it apart, look inside. Um, and, well, this um, was occasionally interesting. Um, I, of course, had a uh, magpie-like uh, practices with tools, my father's tools, and in attempt to get me to leave them alone uh, after a trip, he gave me my very own crescent wrench. That was his first mistake. <laughs> his second was, if I'm not at his elbow going, how, why, what does it do, worry. He had a very productive morning at his bench in the shop. He got up, turned around, and there I was, with a big smile on my face, and the lawnmower in pieces, <laughs> in an arc around me. I was two and a half. <laughs> um, I taught myself some basics of electronics by collecting the uh, dead TV sets that people put out and dissecting them and making stuff out of the parts. You know, a couple of TVs, a ham handbook, and you could screw up radio reception for, you know, a mile or two. <laughs> now, as a kid, of course, you never have any money and um, you are always breaking your bicycle and so, I had to learn how to fix it, and then things didn't improve when I got old enough to have cars. I would buy things that were, uh, well, you know, probably past their last leg, and so I got to be a very good diagnostic mechanic, and even better at fixing things by the side of the road with a rock and a, a bit of bailing wire. Um, now, sort of formal things, how I wound up where I am. Well. I started out in the computer industry and was doing that for close to a quarter century. Um, at some point, uh, I sort of overdid it with typing and my hands are uh, not necessarily the most reliable devices anymore. And so I turned into a manager, sigh. Um, <laughs> but um, at least it paid well, so I could wind, I wound up with a, a, a basement very full of t machine tools, which I find very um, relaxing. And, well, t in 2000, two things happened. One, I saw this TV show called Junkyard Wars. <laughs> and about five minutes in, I was going, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> oh, yeah, you've got the right idea there. Now, uh, what you need is... And it was very clear I had to do it. And uh, the next morning, I um, was uh, busily tracking it down. It turns out it has a different name in the rest of the world, which made it take a little bit longer. Um, but I tracked down the pr production company, and they said, yeah, we'll consider an application for a team from the colonies. So I sent out word to a bunch of friends and said, pass this on. And, uh, three of us came together and we formed the New England Rubbish Deconstruction Society, otherwise known as the Nerds. It was truth in advertising. <laughs> and um, probably to their dismay, perhaps, uh, they took us. Um, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, we got to build, the first thing was a two-person wet sub. Uh, then we got to convert a car to run on coal-fired steam. And for the final that year, 
um, which we were apparently weren't supposed to get to, but <laughs> um, we cut a Land Rover in half and made a firefighting boat out of it. <laughs> which got us all manner of hate mail from Land Rover owners. <laughs> now, anyway, I came back to the city and went back to work. Um, chance to recover. Um, the show is fun, but it's an amazing amount of work. I remember waking up the morning after the first one I did and my body going to me, aren't you old enough to know better yet? <laughs> so that was fine. And then came the, the pop of the, uh, the web bubble and I was busily looking for work and looking for work and looking for work. And in the meantime, I, some people invited me to come give a talk and I got a couple of um, solicitations. Can you build us a? And of course, every school teacher I knew wanted me to come to, their, come to talk to their class. So now, that's what I do. I, I never did find a, a, a desk again, as it were. Um, I build strange machines when people want them. Um, I will do team training. I will put tools in your hands and have you make strange machines. I consider this a fine alternative to trust balls and rope climbing and things like that. Um, and probably the most fun, though, is when I go do things with kids. Um, anyway. Uh, some of the other things that some, some people may have seen that I've had a hand in, with a bunch of other artists, we built a 14-passenger human-powered bus called the Bussicle. <laughs> um, I managed, the, the people that appeared on the show decided to have an American alumni reunion, and they decided the venue was the, down in Delaware at the Pumpkin Chunk, throwing pumpkins. And it turns out there are a couple of teams in Boston, and it turns out I knew someone on one. And so I said, can I bum a ride with you guys? Um, by the time we got down to Delaware, I was on the team, for sure. Uh, over the next two years, um, we built ourselves a ballista. Think crossbow for the Jolly Green Giant. Uh, it is 30 feet across the bow tips, weighs four tons. <laughs> Um, it will throw a 10-pound pumpkin 1,200 feet, which is good for dead last in its class. <laughs> but it's fun. And from that, I actually get to call myself a professional siege engineer because having done that, other people have invited me to build them catapults. For example, that one. They've even paid me. Strange thing. Um, a rock band. There's a song. It's a the lyrics appear to be about driving on the, on the BQE and getting passed by someone in a good old American land yacht where the driver is so short you can't see them over the seat. It's called Car No Driver. And for some reason, the imagery the director wanted in the foreground was robot girls dancing, and in the background was me assembling a large catapult and finishing up with a piano flying through the air. That's the piano mover from hell. <laughs> um, and having done all this, you know, I said I, I will show up and, um, you know, save you from trust falls, but I also go and corrupt youth. Um, I go and it's a lot of fun. You gather up dead appliances. Uh, sewing machines are great. Lawnmowers, of course, my favorite. Um, things that have lots of gears and springs inside and no power cords. And you bring them tools and you tear them, to tear them into as small a pieces as you can manage. And hopefully you can get them to pause long enough to point out, and that's interesting because that's what that does. Um, although this actually grew out of an attempt to get them to use tools. Because it turns out that um, kids these days don't ever touch a tool. They're sitting there in front of the keyboard or, or their touch screen. And so I, I, at first I had tried just to have, 
to go directly to having them try and build something. And they just didn't have the tools to do it. They d hadn't ever seen a mechanical, you know, they say, well, I've got this round thing and I wanted to make move side to side. And they, haven't, they didn't have the image of, oh, I need a crank or things like that. So looking inside other machines gave them that. But also, it was my chance to teach them, you know, all right, these are the various kinds of screws out there. And yes, you can't, you have to get the matching kind of screwdriver to be able to take them out. And you turn them this way to, to get them out and this way to put them back. But it works. Um, and I did discover a few other things when I did that. To my surprise, it seems that at least urban eight-year-old boys don't want to get their hands covered in grease. This came as a great shock to me. I mean, you put something oily and have to say, let's take this apart, and they go put on rubber gloves. But also to my surprise and delight, the eight-year-old girls get, there, get in there and get grease up to their elbows without hesitation. So maybe in a few years, it will be Susie putting the frog in Calvin's pocket <laughs> instead of the other way around. I'm trying to remember what other. Oh, yeah. When we finally do get to building things, um, one thing that was never apparent in the US but was apparent in the UK cuts of the show, we're gifted with another six minutes commercials per hour, was that the thing was actually a way to, the show was actually a way to trick kids into learning some science. And the, they had these little 15 second animated cart chalkboard drawings. And those were the point. And the uh, you know, crazy bearded biker types uh, hitting things with sledgehammers was just to keep them watching in between them. Um, so I designed my projects with the kids the same way. Um, I wanted to teach them about gears and chains and belts and all that. And so we built Blendy, which is a pedal-powered blender. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we took two bicycles and cut them up and stuck them together and, and various other things. And the result is something that you turn the pedals once and the blender blades go 100 times, and it really will make a smoothie. Uh, matter of fact, if you put an eight-year-old on it, you can get, you can get obliterate. <laughs> I've discovered eight-year-olds have two pedaling speeds, zero RPM and warp nine. <laughs> but anyhow. Jeff like Del Papa, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Jeff. Anyway, one last point. What do you um, got? What do you got? A very elaborate nerd joke. <laughs> so help yourself. So uh, for those of you in the back who can't see, we got a stack of papers over here. So come up and grab one of these. There's obviously, he's probably tricking you into learning something <laughs> in there. But it's also apparently an elaborate joke. So you can feel free to come and get one. Jeff, I wonder, um, you touched on it a little bit. But you talked about the fact that um, in your experience, kids these days aren't used to building, aren't used to having tools in their hands. Does that worry you? A bit. Um, if nothing else, that I, I want to have someone who's willing to buy my tools when I'm done with them. <laughs> Great point. Great point. Your retirement plan has gone out the window. But no, I mean, um, it just, I mean, I so, it's just so rewarding to put something together and have it, you know, sit there and actually work. And, you know, they're not going to get that. Do you find it, is it, is it on some deeper level freeing or liberating to be able to start to understand how something works and be able to either build something or manipulate it in a way? Like, is, is that ultimately empowering for a person? I, well, in my case, it's necessary. I'd go nuts if I didn't do that. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, being able to um, have, you know, oh, uh, something's wrong there. And to have some idea of what's going on inside means, all right, well, that's, that's going to be a big problem, that's going to be a small problem. 
It's something I can, oh, yeah, I just need to put this thing back on and it will work again. Or, yeah, I need to go get another one. Um, yeah. So just knowing what's going on inside things is, I, I, mean, I, I can't see getting through life without that, but some people clearly do. Final question. Single, you got to pick one. Single most indispensable tool that you own. The one that you would never, ever be without. One. Cutting torch. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't have a cutting torch, right? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Del Papa. <laughs> uh, what's your name, sir? Lou. Lou. Round of applause for Lou, ladies and gentlemen. So Lou came up to me and he said, look, if I knew how to tweet, I would tweet you my oddest job, but I don't, so can I just tell you? And I said, of course you can, Lou. Of course you can. So he did. So Lou, tell me about the oddest job that you ever had. Okay. My first job... I found a job helping set up a new shoe store, if anyone knows the Berlin Turnpike in Connecticut. And this was before Route 91 was. And it was the main road between New York and Hartford and then to Boston. And it had stores on it like Route 9 near Framingham, but it was four-lane highway. So I helped set up this store, and then they put me in a clown suit and put me in the center medium two lanes in each direction. And there I am, a 16-year-old kid, never had a job before, pointing people. Go into the shoe town, go into the shoe town, dressed as a clown. Why is a clown? I mean, th Probably just to get people's attention as they were driving by. But I don't know, I'm a 16-year-old kid. Did you, how much did you earn for this? I think I was making $1.10 an hour. Lou, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for him. Thank you. All right, I still do not have a correct answer to the trivia question, so if people want to take a shot, find me. I want to buy somebody a drink. I need a correct answer. So uh, just a reminder, I've tweeted out the list, as has WGBH, and keep tweeting your odd jobs to us. Use the hashtag Boston Talks. All right, our next speaker. So... When Grace was young, Grace Teo wanted to be a fashion designer. This was her dream, to be a fashion designer. And so she did what anybody who has a dream to be a fashion designer would do, and she got a PhD in health sciences technology, which is obviously the path to fashion design, because eventually she found her way to it. She's the co-founder of Open Style Labs, this is an organization that makes stylish clothing for people with disabilities. Let's hear it for Grace Teo. Hi, it's wonderful. Is this on? Okay, it's wonderful to be here tonight. Um, all right. So when I tell people I design clothing for people with disabilities, most people scratch their head and they're like, "Why do they need special clothing?" Um, so what I like to tell people is that when we look around us nowadays and we look at buildings, we're really used to seeing wheelchair ramps and kind of understanding accessibility from that angle. But think about if, say, you're a visitor to Boston, you brought all your luggage with you, and then the luggage got lost in a flight, and now you're in Boston and you only have pajamas with you, would you have come tonight? So probably not, right, because most of you look pretty sweetly dressed. Um, and so that is exactly what we're going after, is that clothing is actually a barrier to social accessibility. Um, and so most of us have never really been in a situation where you're forced to wear one thing and one thing only, but a lot of people with disabilities are in that situation. The closest I have ever come to imagining what that is like is thinking back to when I was an eight-year-old and I had to put on glasses for the first time. I don't know how many of you had that experience, but my mom was one of those moms that was like, you are not gonna get the cool-looking glasses, you're gonna get the big plastic Coke bottle glasses because those ones won't break. So I had to wear them to school and I remember feeling terrible about it. Um, and, you know, eventually I got used to it, and I was like, I'm a nerd, yeah, like, I'm going to own this. 
Um, but, you know, that's how I felt at that time. And some people have, you know, maybe some of you wore braces, and you can, Im you can remember that feeling of wearing braces. Um, so that's where we really come, come from. And, and that experience, just wearing glasses, kind of sensitized me um, to being very self-conscious about appearance. But my sister was also born with a cleft palate. And for those of you who don't know, that means your, your, your lip and your upper palate is split in half. Um, and so she went through more than 10 surgeries before she reached the age of 15 to correct that de defect because there were problems with her jaw and things like that. Um, and one day, this lady, while she was recovering in the hospital, came up to her and with all the good intentions in the world said, you know, someone who looks like you needs to work harder than other people. And you can imagine how that felt. And so, you know, being her sister, I was obviously extremely protective. And of course, I'm sure this woman meant, you know, if you look like that, you're going to have to work harder to make up for it. Um, and so that always kind of sensitized me to the fact that, all right, your appearance does count for a lot in our society. Um, so anyway, like Edgar said, I can't see where he is. Like, like Edgar said, um, I grew up wanting to be a makeup artist because of that. I want to make people feel beautiful. Um, but, you know, I was told it wasn't a stable job. I was in a conservative environment. And so I ended up going to a career fair, and I was like, all right, if I can't be a makeup artist, what am I going to do? And I, so I asked someone, I was like, what do I need to study to manufacture cosmetics? Because my plan was I'm going to manufacture cosmetics, and then I'll sidle over, and I'll be a makeup artist. <laughs> so as you can tell, it worked out. <laughs> so I, got, I, I went into engineering, and I kind of got distracted with doing a PhD along the way, and got, got wrapped up in all of that. Um, and then, as part of my PhD, um, we got stuffed in a hospital one day, and they were like, you know, you guys are scientists, but you guys really have to understand what are the problems that really happen in the clinic, because you can't just be in your lab trying to make medicines without knowing what people really go through. Um, and I met this woman. She had multiple sclerosis. Um, and what I asked to all patients was, what do you miss most about being healthy? So this woman, she was sitting in, in an electric scooter. I thought she was going to say, I miss being able to move around. <laughs> Instead, she turned to me and she said, well, to be honest, not being able to get around isn't that big of a deal. What I really miss is my independence. And so she went on to tell me, you know, my husband's away on a business trip. And you look at me right now, I look decent and everything, but I took one hour to put on, put on my clothes this morning. And so that got me thinking, um, and I thought, you know what, this is a really kind of a simple problem that no one's really tackling. And it was the first time I realized that there were all these dressing difficulties for people with disabilities. Um, but I didn't know anything about fashion. So what I decided was that I would make an educational program. So that's what teachers do, right? Like you don't really, like you, since, since I didn't know anything, I was like, I'm going to make an educational program and I'm going to invite all these cool speakers to come into the educational program and I'll just learn alongside my students and how to design clothes. Um, so while we created, me and my co-founder, Alice, we created this program at MIT called Open Style Lab. And what we do is we invite someone with a disability um, someone with an engineering background, someone with a fashion design background, and someone with an occupational therapy background to come together and over 10 weeks to come up with a piece of clothing for the, their team member with a disability. And they all do it together. Um, and so they spend like about two or three weeks being in very close contact with the person with a disability to really understand what their lifestyle looks like. Um, and then they go through three rounds of designing and testing with that person so that it's really customized for their lifestyle. Okay, so I've told you all of that. That was all the story. Um, so I, I'm going to kind of show you a product right now. Um, so this was the first year we had a client who came in. His name is Ryan DeRoche. He used to be a competitive biker. But while he was in Spain biking, he flew over his handlebars and is now a wheelchair user. So if you've ever seen 
well, okay, all of you have been caught in the rain at some point, um, I, I'm assuming. And, you know, most of the time our shoulders get wet or the top of our heads get wet. But for people in a wheelchair, you're sitting down. So really, it's your lap that gets wet most of the time. And if you look on the internet, the one thing you'll find for people in wheelchairs when it's raining is wheelchair ponchos. Now, I, I don't think I'm really fussy about fashion, to be honest, but like, these ponchos are not the most beautiful things. They look like really big tents that just cover your entire wheelchair. So he came to us and he said, I would rather get wet and <laughs> than wear one of those things. Um, and he was like, you know what? I'm a competitive biker. I'm cool. I'm a hoodie kind of guy. So can you all make something that looks kind of cool that's not a poncho? Um, so Evan. Evan, hi. OK, Evan's my assistant. You look wonderful. <laughs> OK, so what we did was to make this jacket. Um, and the goal was to look exact, make it look exactly like a sports jacket, exactly like a hoodie jacket. But what happens is that this pouch you see in front here, if you're sitting down, you can pull it out. And it completely opens <laughs> this way. Yep. <laughs> Um, and it just covers the lab. And, and you know, this small thing, so, you know, it comes together completely by magnets because if you don't have a lot of dexterity in your hands, then it's a lot easier to use. Um, and the other thing is that you can see the reflective piping on the sides. So this is what we call reflective piping. And that was more than decoration or just for visibility. It was really to make sure that when the rain came down onto their laps, the reflecting piping would shoot the rain um, up and off their laps instead of it pour, uh, pulling onto their wheelchair seat as they were sitting down. Yeah, so it were, thank you. Yeah, so that's the rain jacket, and we're really proud of it. And, and I think what I love best about it is that we don't think it's just for people with disabilities. It's if you're a biker, or you're a hiker, or you're a sports spectator in a sports stadium, anybody can use it. So it's inclusion in all the different senses. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you. Oh, Grace Tao, everybody. Grace, tell well, b besides uh, besides the jacket, what else? What other kinds of things have you guys made? Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so most of the time really, we make stuff for wheelchair users, but we also served a client with autism this summer. Um, and so for a lot of people with autism, they're extreme. Actually, some of you may hear my experience this. You might be extremely sensitive to seams or to elastic or to like tags at the back of your clothing. Yeah, you got so a big it's yes happening up here. You're yeah. like, yes. I've <laughs> you been know how you do like my cut whole it out. life for somebody to understand that. Yeah. <laughs> so she, she's the same way. Um, so what we did was we made a shirt for her that basically cut out the side seams and only had a back seam. Um, and then I don't know if you guys know what ultrasonic welding is, but um, it's almost like using glue to put your shirts together. And so it makes the seams a lot smoother on the skin. Um, and also people, I, again, once again, all of us experience this, but people with autism in particular can appreciate having tight garments that gives them a sense of like getting a hug and it's very calming. So it was a compression garment. So at the end of the day, the garment actually looked a lot like a Nike, like athleisure sort of shirt. Um, and uh, th they're hoping to bring it to market as well. Um, and then I guess a lot of people also ask me if um, people who are blind have a sense of aesthetic and do they have clothing issues? Um, and actually that's one of the biggest, ch biggest challenges. Um, so I spoke to um, one of a, one, a friend, actually just a friend, um, and she was telling me how when she grew up, all she could feel were Barbie dolls. And so that entire time, she assumed that what all women looked like were Barbie dolls. 
And so she thought that she had the most abnormal body. And it didn't take until a long time after that she realized what most people look like. Wow. Wow. So have you, have you worked with the blind to develop clothing? Not yet. Um, so that's something along the way. And I think that's actually going to be more of a computer science problem instead of an engineering problem. Because for people who are blind, it's really hard to online shop, for example. Um, there, there are also people, so even if you shop in a physical brick and mortar store, yeah. there are like color sensors that you can use. Color sensors right now, in terms of technology, are not great. They can't huh. tell if, you know, you have like different patterns in your clothing. They can't tell between the colors then. Um, they're also not good at different lighting settings. And so it's actually really challenging for people who are blind to shop independently for clothing. And that's the next problem you're going to tackle and solve in like a year and then move <laughs> on to the next one. Yes, and then cancer <laughs> after that. <laughs> Perfect. Grace Teo, everybody. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, how are we doing now at this point in the night? Are we still feeling pretty good? Are we having a good time? Yeah, that, that feels like a delight. It feels like you guys are having a delightful. I'm having a good time. I'm having a good time. So we've been asking uh, folks out here about their, uh, their own odd jobs and uh, been asking you to tweet. Uh, is Alan White still here? Alan White. All right, so Alan, I'm going to need you to come up. Round of applause for Alan White, ladies and gentlemen. So Alan White simply tweets at me. My oddest job, colon, consultant witch. So I, I got to tell you, we're going to need more information than that. What does that mean? What is a consultant witch? All right. Um, so first off, everyone, I am a Wiccan. If you are familiar with that, it is an Earth-based religion, legally recognized religion here in the United States. Yay! Um, and I am also a witch, so I practice rituals and things like that. I was involved in a production of Shakespeare's Macbeth this summer, where I was asked to teach some actresses how to do magic. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I did ask the director, I said, you do know that Shakespeare wrote fiction, right? Because his witches do some evil shit. Um, and we don't really do that, but uh, I uh, had a chance to teach some actresses about meditation and ritual and sharing energy with each other, and of course I was given the title Consultant Witch. Wow, that's amazing. And it was the best production of Macbeth that has ever been done, right? Oh, it was at least the witches. Oh yeah, absolutely. The witches, they were the best. I was so proud of them. You, if you missed it, I weep for you. One tear. Alan White, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Uh, since we're in sort of a spiritual realm in talking with Alan, actually, it's a pretty nice segue into our next speaker, uh, Kelly Sutliff. Where is Kelly? Is Kelly? Where are you, Kelly? So let's hear it for Kelly Sutliff. Kelly is a working psychic medium, an award-winning author, and um, I got to tell you, just in my brief conversations with her in the lead-up to this, uh, my mind was completely like transformed in terms of my understanding of, of what that means and the kind of work that is out there and being done by psychic mediums. And she's going to give us a window into that right now. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for Kelly Sutliff. Hi, everybody. I'm Kelly. And I'm the prop tonight. I didn't bring any props because I am the, the prop. And um, I'm a psychic medium. I live in Andover, Mass. I have three children who are 20, 18, and 17. And they are... Um, and I'm married um, to my husband, Tom, and I live like a, yeah, I would say a normal life, but you would say not a normal life. Um, I grew up with this gift as um, intuition. And when I was a little girl, I would dream with people that I didn't know in my dreams. And I thought everybody did that. And I thought, of course you didn't know who was in your dreams. And people would come through and they'd talk to you and they'd tell you stories and they'd tell them, tell you where they were from. And and, you know, they'd have certain dress on, and I thought that it was everybody's normal. And so it didn't take me long, it was when I was nine years old, that my grandmother passed away, and my grandma Sloan came through to me one night, and she said, gave a message to my mom, and she was talking about, you know, 
she had cancer, why she died. She told a message to my mom that she loved her. She was fine. She was good. Well, my grandmother was a farmer in Illinois who planted the, you know, cycle of the, the land by the moon cycle and was very intuitive herself. So why wouldn't she come through to a young girl who was intuitive like myself? And I remember getting up that morning and saying to my mom, Grandma Sloan was in my room last night. She said this to me. She said this to you. And my mom said, okay, Kelly, that's great. Put your uniform on and, and get ready for breakfast, you know? Where in my house, and that was just what it was back then. Like, you know, I was raised Irish Catholic, 12 years Catholic school. You know what I mean? You just never talked about psychic ability. You never talked about that genre. And, but with my children, because of who I am, um, we're very vivid talkers about psychic work in my, in my home. And my children are very intuitive. They all have the, t the gift of different ways. I'm very clairvoyant. I'm very cl clairaudient. I hear, I see, I feel um, with intuitions. And, and I've worked with it to, to boundary it and know what I'm, I'm doing with it. And that was, you know, in 15 years of working in this field and, and discovering it, I have learned to do it, as I want to say, the right way. And so it's not the, you know, hocus pocus, witchy poo, I'm dating myself with puff, puff and stuff here, um, type of attitude. But, you know, what it is is actually real stuff. It's real people in, in the work that, that it is today. And as my children would tell you, and they know, is that, you know, we do this gig in our house called Psychic Tuesdays where... Um, on Tuesday nights, we get together, we meditate, we talk about psychic intuition, um, and we, I make them work details. An example, when they were four, five, six years old, I would say to them, all right, mommy's thinking of a color in my head. It's red, blue, or green, which color it is. And they'd all say, say green, because that was in my head. Or I would be, you know, we, they would have dreams or experiences, like when I was a little girl, and I would then, you know, pull more out of them so that they could understand what that meant. And not to fear it, because I was talking with somebody tonight that, you know what, we, we with children, if we don't really um, attune them and show them that it's, it's like your best friend, psychic ability is their best friend, intuition. Um, it saves you in many ways. You know, don't walk down this alley. It could be a bad thing. You listen. You know, don't go, you know, down, you know, you're in a business transaction. You trust your instinct of who you want to be in business with, right? I mean, that's your intuition that's all following it. So as young people, we forget to give them that. And that's where I've shifted my family so that, that you know what, they trust it, they know it, they feel it. And along with my work is, you know, it's oftentimes that I can, I work in, um, I never thought I would work in this line of work, but I'm a psychic investigator. So five years ago, um, I, up, well, I work with, agency. So I work with state agency, I work with private detectives, people working on cases, local cases, national cases. I've worked with the, um, an FBI group called Find, Find Me Too, which is a former FBI agent working with missing persons people. And so, you know, when we get a case, or I get a case, the only thing we are, are, I'm allowed to get, or the only thing I want to get, because I want to keep myself very naive to whatever it is, is I get the person's name, where they went missing, their um, location, their birth date, and a picture. So those four items, that's all. And what I do is when I go in, and this will be doing, you know, at my home when I'm in between doing laundry or driving somebody to a practice or what have you, I'm working a case. And in the process of that, what happens is that I call it my psychic press release, and I do a who, what, when, where, how of where this person was missing. And I fill that in, and I get detail, and I get... Um, all the detail of where they are. I can tell and sense, because with my gift of my line of work, I'm a psychic medium. I can read psychically, intuitively, so I, that's like the stuff that you read when people go to get, you know, what's my future, what's, what's going on, should I go forward with this business deal, that those psychic hits that I give to my clients. And then the mediumship part is the part that I'm the conduit to the other side. So I reach my, my vibration to a higher level because the energy on the other side is when past loved ones come through to give messages to you. Now we've all seen shows, programs, you know, an enlightened awareness of, of how this, this whole gig works. But what happens is that the energy on the other side is extremely high and ours is very low. And so I have to meet my energy with that other side in the middle as a conduit to, to give the message off. And 
So when I'm working in a, um, an investigation, I can tell in my energy and my information in the shift whether that person's alive or not, because in that shift of that energy, what happens is the message is coming through for the person who's passed versus the, per the information would just be general and more psychic information. So when we give that information, we pile it up and we give it off to the investigators and, and, and then it, they take it from there because that's my, my job. It's just to be the, another conduit role and to pass it on to the, the other people who need to research it. So I've worked with agencies here. I've worked with Boston University. There's a group of us at one point was the Cold Case Collaborative. It was um, the person who ran that um, PI program, uh, Tom Shamshack, and he would, we would work with him and he would bring detectives in and cold cases and cases he knew about and then um, current cases and we'd all work as a group. What was amazing, when you work in a group of a bunch of psychics working together, we always work individual. Nobody works, to, works in the same time. So you write all your information. It's like automatic writing. You're getting the, the, the psychic press release that I just talked about, giving that information out. And then when you start to share it, it always amazes me how in sync it is. It's all the same, which shows me the link to the other side or the other information of how we connect and how that information is given to us, right? So in that whole modality, in this, as, in, as an example of a story, um, I was about six years ago, and this is when I really started in, in psychic investigations. Um, a man calls, um, uh, I see a woman, first of all, in my kitchen. Now that sounds crazy, here I'm cooking, I love to cook. And so I'm in my kitchen and I see a flash, and you'll see lots of flash of energy, you see physical bodies sometimes in my work, which sounds crazy, but it happens. But it would because I'm pretty ramped up, so I can catch that. And um, I'm in my kitchen, I see this small woman, I thought it was a young girl, long hair, dark hair and very petite and I was like okay I'm going to get a call someone's going to call me for a reading because obviously spirit's showing up early and um, I go forward and all of a sudden I start to um, the phone call rings that night and it was actually um, during the election with Scott Brown I'll never forget that and this man calls me from Michigan and says um, my sister's missing I'm sure you've heard about it and I said listen I haven't heard anything where I'm, I'm all involved with Scott Brown you know um, election right now and here in Massachusetts so he goes on to tell me can I have a reading I said we have to do it tomorrow I can't don't read on the fly um, in an instant and so the next day I start describing this person this is his sister who's missing and she is a woman, I thought she was a young girl. She's 4'11", she's petite, dark hair, long dark hair. And she had gone to church um, in Grosse Point, Michigan, and she had been taken on a Tuesday night. And the, um, I gave a reading for an hour and a half, almost two hours with details. I was giving names of who she was connected to, details of how, the, where I felt that she was, how she was abducted, um, how she passed, I knew she was in spirit because this is who I saw before the reading. So, I, and, and since then, um, huge investigation that's occurred, the details that I gave at that time forwarded to the daughter um, of the case. And in the case, I said to her when I read for her, it was back in, uh, following fast forward in January, I said, your mom's gonna be found She's going to be found by fishermen. I'm seeing the bridge to Canada. I'm seeing the Belle Isle side of Detroit. Um, I'm seeing this area um, of where she is. I'm seeing springtime, and she will be she, she will be found. Her body will be found. She, my birthday is March 21st, the first day of spring. She was found on my birthday, um, and her daughter calls me. Found on my birthday, two fishermen were fishing. She, her body was hooked onto a, a line. That's how they found her. Um, the, by the bridge, I said she was. By the river, where she was. And hence, they re retrieved her body, which has now fast-forwarded into a six-year case, which probably, out of all the investigations I've ever done, will probably be solved because of, of the data and what, what this family's done. So part of the piece is that when we work, and... It's even like I just received the other day, there's a young gal that's missing in Connecticut and another psychic friend of mine called me and, and sent me a picture, it's on my phone right now, and saying, can you work on this case? So 
psychics today, not only do they do just readings, but you know what, in, like in my world, we do psychic investigations, psychics help each other, where they'll say, hey, I have this case, can you help me with this? Give me the data, what do you get? We send it off to the investigations. Psychics today are modern today. So, you know, back in the day, when psychics have been around our world forever, you would have, you know, you could consult to a king and queen and they'd be saying, okay, um, how are the tr crops gonna be this year? Give me your answer. You know, how are we going to war? We're going to war, are we gonna win? Um, should I behead this guy? I'm gonna be, uh, you know, yes or no? Which I can't imagine that pressure, can you imagine? And, but today, you know what, we also consult, which I have before, with finances for businesses or consult businesses in general where, uh, you know, I'm hired to work with stockbrokers or I'm hired to look at, you know, new businesses for people or business transactions. And, you know, there's people who work in the, F you know, with agencies, FBI, Homeland Security, you know, and, and that's a lot of my line of work too where I'll get, um, you know, when you give it, get it, you give it, is what I say. And in my line of work, because of, you know, what I do, I often get information with world affairs, and I have the right people now, today, versus when I, before things happened before 9-11, um, when I was getting, you know, informational on that, I was able to, I, I didn't know what to do with it. Today, I know different, where when I see things that, when things occurred in the, prior to the Boston Marathon bombing, or prior to, um, you know, uh, um, the hit situations that happened in Florida um, recently, or the, the situation in Paris, or the situation, again, in California, I give the information to the sources that I trust so they can just take it. And then they, are, it's their jobs to then go forward. So besides raising all these kids, and all these kids are in college now, I, you know, um, you know, a typical mom, you know what I mean? Raising my kids, being a part of the community, you know, working on nonprofits for my interest, along with, you know, working in this line of field that is absolutely amazing because I love what I do. It's a spiritual aspect of it um, where it has to have spirituality and you have to be spiritual in order to do it. Otherwise, you couldn't. And so I'm able to, to bridge it. And the cool thing about it is, um, you know what, psychic ability never, you, you never raise your hand to say I'm gonna be a psychic medium when I grow up, you never would, like who would want to, you know, really. And so, you know, but thank goodness that it's more of accepted today. And the great thing is even, um, you know, when I think back even to 15 years ago, I would go to a cocktail party and people would say, Kelly, what do you do for a living? And I'd hide behind my real estate license and I'd say, oh, I, was, I sell real estate, which I did. And I say, you know, I'd sell real estate, and you know what, I'd, under my breath, I'd say I'm a, I work as a psychic medium. And people were like, what? You know, what's the lottery numbers? Come on, what are they? You know what I mean? They'd all be funny like that, and I'd get a lot of razzing, which I still do today, but it's all in fun. But it's very much so where today, when I go into, you know, a room or whatever, people who I don't know, or even my friends will say, Kelly, what case are you working on? What's, what's up with this? What, you know, what, what's the deal? You know, tell me this, what do you feel? you know, all of that good stuff, and we're so open, but we're also open because, you know what, our intuition is open today, so we're all intuitive. Everybody in this room can tell me a story. I'm sure of someone who's passed that they felt, or in a dream, or in a dream state, or you hear a song and you're thinking of your mom or dad who passed away, or, you know, the intuition hits that you get, you know, whether or not to go down 128, you know, on this road, I'm gonna take a different road because, you know, something doesn't feel right and you find out that there was a huge accident that you missed, you know what I mean? That's your intuition, that's our, our best friends talking to us and, and that's the importance of, of kind of what I, how I work as, on a daily basis. And I guess the most important message of, you know, tonight is really about we all can receive, we can all ask for signs and symbols, we can all do it and, and, and trust in it, so, um, I hope that helps explain exactly how my world is. But thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Kelly Sullivan, hang out with me for a second. Okay, yeah? I will. All right. Um, you ever freak yourself out? I mean, do you ever get like scared about like... Oh, okay, you wanna hear a funny story? I'll be real quick. Funny and scary? Well, funny and scary, yeah. Yes. All right, so I have a book out. 
and it's called Listen Up, The Other Side is Talking. It's all about my work and, and it's examples. It's like an award-winning book, right? Yeah, it's Mul two awards, actually. Awards. Yeah. There you go. So I um, was going to Book Expo in New York, and if anybody knows about anything about publishing, like that's the mecca of where you go to get your books published, to, to meet authors, you know, they're all there. And so it's like one time a year in June. So my friend Nancy and I are there to um, just kind of promote our books and go. And we book last minute at the New Yorker Hotel. And we're in the New Yorker and we walk in and they're like, we have one room left. We're like, okay, we'll take it. And so Nancy is a, a psychic medium also, and she's a good friend of mine. And she's actually a sketch artist, um, a spirit artist. So when you go to her for a reading, she'll, she'll draw who she sees and gives you the picture. And she works on with me cases because we work, she'll draw the perpetrators for me. And so we then, um, what do you call, go into the New Yorker Hotel. And we're on the 33rd floor. And I'm like, oh, I love threes. This feels good. My birthday's 321. I'm into the, you know, the three number. And so we check into room 3327. And on the door, it has a big gold plaque, and it's of Nikola Tesla. And so, got to be honest with you, I was a communication major like you were in college, hey, hey, hey. okay? And I was like, oh, I didn't even know who Nikola Tesla was, all right? So my friend, um, so I'm like, I walk in the room with Nancy, and I said, Nance, I said, I don't think we're going to get, like, much sleep tonight. And she says, I don't think we are either. So anyway, so, there's, so we're in the room. We're feeling all this, this energy, mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. Go to the book expo. That night, I called my husband, and I said, Tom, I, um, I said, you're not going to believe it. I said, you know, we're staying in Nikola Tesla's room, it says here in the plaque. And I said, do you know who he is? And he says, he's an, my husband's an engineer, and he says, Kelly, you know, he's talking about the electrical current and everything he did, yeah, Niagara yeah, Falls, yeah. and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And he says to me, all right, he said, he must have been on the computers because he's, he's Googling, right? And I said, he says, hey, Cal, um, where are you staying again? And I said, the New Yorker. And he said, hmm, it says here he died in room 3327. <laughs> so then, what? that evening, that night, I said, Nancy, we are so hosed. You know what I mean? <laughs> we are not going to sleep tonight. Because what are the odds of two mediums checking in last minute, getting his room? <laughs> so as we're in the room, what do you, um, I, it's 3 o'clock. And spirit tends to come back and forth between 3 and 5 like if you were feeling in your dreams. And so it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and I can feel his energy. And I'm so tired because we drove a lot early in the morning. I'm like, I am not getting up. I'm not turning over. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And so anyways, the next morning, Nancy says to me, you're not going to believe what happened. I said, what? She goes, did you feel him at 3 o'clock in the morning? I said, yeah, I wasn't turning over. And she says to me, <laughs> she goes, I was playing solitaire on my phone, and she says, and I stopped playing, and all of a sudden, it started playing for me. And I said to her, I said, but, you know, Nancy, he would have liked that energy. He probably made it. You know what I mean? Like, think back what he did. And so, wow. but that's kind of my world. Like, we, you know, we've been, we, I, we can go on vacation. And you know what? The Sutliffs don't do well in old B&Bs, okay? Because spirit always finds us. And, you know, or I can be like, go to England, and I, and I swear, I say to my guides, everybody, I'm not open, I'm not receiving, but then I end up like in the dungeons in England in a castle, and that's way bad, you know what I mean? And I, and I get all this information and see spirit and, you know, but you know what, that's, I don't, I don't fear it at all because I know it can't harm you. And anytime you do have experiences like that, if you get the heebie-jeebies because you've been someplace and your hair kind of goes up in the back of your head or whatever, it's really about you know that you're always in control. They can't come back and harm you. They can't do anything like that. And you know what? You just got to say, get out of here. You know what I mean? Go into the light. Go wherever. And, and then as soon as you say that, it's gone. Because they know, you know, the energy, they're not allowed. And I always say to people, like, when they have haunted houses and all, it's, or they feel their house is haunted and it's old, I always say, you know what? Um, do they pay the mortgage, those ghosts that are living there? No. So, you know what? Why would you let a stranger into your home? Why would you allow a ghost in your home? So people sometimes like that vibe or think it's cool to do that. But to me, in my world, I'm like, you know, get them out of there. And, and it, even for myself is I've gone on one ghost hunt my whole life, and I'll never do it again. Because it's always like I want to cross them over into the other side. Like, go. You're not meant to be here. Go. 
And so I'm not a very good ghost hunter, you know what I mean? Because I want to send them on their own way. But, but it's very much so, you should never, you know, as my grandmother always used to say, you should, uh, you know, the one who came to me in spirit, you, you, you know, you don't fear the dead, you fear the living. And, and there's truth in that. And, um, but you know what, it's all just kind of, like I said, my world of where I go and, and stuff, but never ever do I get frightened because I know I'm very protected and honored and, and that. Kelly. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to invite all of our speakers to come up on the stage. Is that right there, Abby? Everybody's going to come up. We're going to give you guys a chance if you have some final questions before we break up. In the meantime, since you have the mic, Kelly, we were talking upstairs earlier, and you mentioned that a long time prior to now, you made some predictions about the presidential campaign, right? Uh, I did. I did. What did you, okay. Was, give, give us the, just the basics. When did you make the prediction? What did you predict? Okay. Last October, I was asked to make some predictions. And in the predictions, my the publicist said to me, you know what, um, make it light, Kelly. Like, who's going to be in the primary? Who's going who's gonna to win? Who's going to be our president? And then at the time, what happened was I was, um, and I made a bunch of other, I saw a lot of inf other information, which was about, the, what I saw was happening in Paris two weeks later, and there was a lot of Homeland Security stuff and all the bomb, different, a lot of World Affairs stuff. And some of the things I couldn't even put out in the media that went. And so in my predictions at the time, I saw Trump, Hillary, and the president was um, Trump. What's and, your success rate? Just curious, then, what's your success rate on predictions like this? You know what? <laughs> the, You know, oh, you know what? I met I met recently General Flynn, who Mike Flynn, who's his military um, or consultant. Yeah. And I felt a hell of a, lot, a heck of a lot more comfortable after I met him to know that he'd be in his cabinet and he advises him against Islam terrorism. So yeah, I'm thinking yeah. we're, we'd be okay. But I have very much so. Um, you know what? As an example, I can just give you this, and I'll tell you what, what happened in that list. I had at the time, and this was October last year. Yeah. And I saw at the moment, you know, um, I saw insider trading with other countries that, that the Clinton Foundation was involved with. I saw it connected all the way up to the White House, and it was going to be um, come out in July. And that happened. Hmm. So, you know what? I just give what I get. We all have the power of change. If people don't want that or whatever they choose, I mean, we all have power of change. But... My, I just... That's what you saw. I saw. That's what you saw. It's just, it's just what she saw. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear for all of our speakers. We got a couple minutes left, so if you have a burning question you want to ask one or all of them, give me a hand up and I'll come, uh, I'll come to you. Anybody got anything? Anybody? We got a question coming back here. What is your name? Hi, MJ. I am MJ. Round of applause for MJ. Hey, MJ. Thank you to all three of you. Uh, where can we get the raincoat and how much is it? So we <clears throat> actually attempted to crowdfund it last year on Beta Brand, which is a San Francisco online community. Um, and what happened was that the price point was $100 higher than what we had wanted. So we partnered with them because they were going to do the manufacture. So while it was voted extremely popularly, it did not actually get funded because the price point was too high. So we're actually in talks right now with people trying to figure out who can manufacture and partner with us. So if anyone knows, you know, outdoor sports companies, we, are, we would love to talk to them. But I will say, uh, uh, if you went straight to a manufacturer with a pattern, it will cost you about 300 plus dollars for a single jacket. To, to, if you, if you, so you, the pattern is available, is that what you're saying? And you can take the pattern to somebody to make a custom one for you. Exactly, and you would have to get the materials yourself. That's a great question. Do you know if insurance covers that, is the question? Um, insurance, so the, the reimbursement system in the U.S. does not recognize um, quality of life to be something reimbursable. And therefore, wow. insurance does not cover things like that. Great question. 
Anybody else have a question for, oh, sorry, any of our speakers, anybody, anybody out there? Oh, how is the pattern available, Grace? The patent. Um, there isn't a patent on it. We didn't oh. try to patent it, so we made it open source, in fact. So, but where? But where? Where, where, oh, where you, is the pattern? Yeah, Email the pattern me, uh, grace at openstylelab.org. There you go. Yeah. Question here. I was just wondering, Grace, if there was anything else that you had designed. Yeah, we have more than 20 different solutions right now. Um, and a lot of, well, four of the big ones can be seen on our website right now. And that's www.openstylelab.org. Cool. Um, I was just wondering for the psychic, um, how do you answer people who might be skeptic of like your work and, and what you do? How do I answer skeptics? Yeah, and how often do you get skepticism from people who are like, oh, psychic medium, that sounds like a not real job. Doesn't exist. Well, I always say proof's in the pudding. And you know what? I look at you know, what I connect, who I connect with, my clients, and, and you know, my, my work. Um, so when I say skeptic, I mean, that's pretty general. I mean, you know, do you, I think that, um, I think people who are skeptic of intuition or, or psychic ability, I think that the, sometimes the, they're naive to really what's going on around them because you trust, you, you trust self, right? You trust your gut, you trust your instinct. If you're a mom, you know what? You have mother's instinct, right? When your child's turning around and going for the stove, that's, that's psychic ability. Um, you know, you trust, you know, whether or not to take a job, whether or not to take a job. I think when I, I see people who are skeptic, it's oftentimes um, people sometimes, you know, they don't realize actually what all's intuition is. Um, in psychic ability and trusting it. I think we're, the, we're our own best psychics, to be honest with you, um, in that we use it every day. Um, people want to call it maybe another word or what have you. But as far as, um, and I also think sometimes, you know, people who are skeptics sometimes can have a lot of religious deity um, around them or ingrained in them, that they fear that it's something really bad. But, you know, you can go back into, you know, biblical the Bible or, or different passages, and, and you can reflect on that because they talk about psychics in the Bible. Uh, so, you know, and intuition. I just always, you know, I've always worked in my line of work with a very spiritual basis so that, you know what I mean, it guides me to deliver the proper message um, to people. Overall, I think we've gotten better, like I said, as a society, that people are more willing to try something new or understand it versus what it was even when I grew up or when, you know, um, even 15 years ago when my, you know, when literally I was making baby formula because I had three kids in three years and I was in my kitchen and all of a sudden I said, you know what, I'm going to get back to that psychic thing and do that again. And as soon as I did that, the floodgates came open like I was as a little girl and I didn't know what to do with it. But I channeled it and I worked in t for two years trying to figure out how this whole thing worked to have boundaries with it so it wasn't fearful to me or fearful for others. And that's what, you know, I, I think that's with anything, like, you know, how you present yourself and how you give a message or, or what have you. I mean, you wouldn't go up to somebody and run into them in Costco and say, oh, my gosh, your mother's here. I'm going to give you a message. I mean, that's like, well, for TV stuff. You know, so that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a psychic foul yeah, right there. Yeah, big that's foul, a, that's big foul. True. Cross some boundaries you shouldn't cross. Because you have ah. to have someone's permission to read them. Hmm. And... So, but that's the, the, the component of it. It's, it's more of a, you know, it's all how you present it in, in a reading as such. So, does that help you? I kind of did a long-winded answer, but kind of? Okay. Good answer. All right. Uh, we've got time for one more question, which I'm going to ask to Jeff, because it's been there since the beginning of the whole thing. What's going on with this cat thing that you have there that's been on the stage the whole night? Can you explain to us what that is? Okay. I'm part of a group that has revived kinetic sculpture racing as part of the Cambridge River Fest. And um, this is part of Dizzy, um, which I built, built with the kids at Parts and Crafts for the inaugural uh, race. Uh, we uh, did one lap around the MIT Museum. <laughs> the kids won. Um, 
Dizzy was inspired by um, seeing a cat batting at a butterfly. And so it's built on a um, baby stroller. And as you push it along, his head goes like this, which is how he got the name Dizzy. <laughs> uh, the, the little bird is orbiting over him, and his, his paw is batting at it. Unfortunately, the bird, bird went missing, so now everyone thinks he's, he's walking around giving everyone high fives. <laughs> but um, it's just a fun object, and uh, unlike uh, decisions there, it's light and easy to move. <laughs> so it was the easiest one to bring as an example of your work. Much appreciated, Jeff, Kelly, and Grace. Let's hear it one more time for all of our speakers. But um, fortunately, I had a friend of mine that was a cook with me at the time that had come over our house, and he kind of saw my chili plants, and he said, oh, man, you know, you need some help. Um, so a couple months later, he, the same guy ended up telling me, hey, I've heard about these, these people, city growers, and um, you should check them out. Um, they're doing cool stuff in your neighborhood. You know, you might be interested in this. 